So I grew up in Franklin, Idaho, 17 miles due north of here, in a town of 300 and, and virtually no one. So they asked me to share a little bit about my background, and, and I'll tell you, I graduated from Utah State twice. I uh, started with a degree in psychology, decided I was going to save the world and be a social worker, and found out the world really didn't want to be saved. Uh, switched to business, and I, I found out that the way that you create wealth is that you do that in startup companies. So I first worked as a social worker. I then worked at the Idaho National Engineering Lab, uh, worked at Westinghouse EG&G Idaho with nuclear reactors. And uh, one day was at MIT giving a speech on, on power, power and leadership. And somebody handed me a Wall Street Journal and I picked it up and it was an article on how to be financially independent in America. And I thought, this is great. And it had five ways. Number one, be a doctor. Where's Matthew? Uh, number two, uh, be a lawyer. Number three, inherit it. Number four, marry it. And I thought, well, the first four are definitely out for me. And number five was start a business. And I thought, how hard could it be? So I got a $1.2 million SBA loan and started a franchise restaurant. And I almost went bankrupt. I was terrified. But I turned it around, and after I turned it around and sold it, people started bringing me troubled companies asking me to help. I then moved to Salt Lake City after being the CEO of a public company, and I was asked to vet a small little startup in Park City called Skull Candy. So <clears throat> Rick Alden was the founder, and I met Rick, and he had these great, we call them hockey stick projections, and I said, let me see those books. Let me see your books, Rick. And he said, we're paperless. And I said, Rick, you're going to have to have books, and you're going to have to have a board. So I watched him grow that into a company that did an IPO at a valuation of $550 million, became very interested in startups. And so now I sit on the board of a couple of venture capital firms, one in Silicon Valley, one in New York. I'm an advisor on Springboard that is dedicated to helping women get funding. We've raised $7 million, had IPOs and 123 M&As. But what I'm going to share with you tonight I think is the most critical skill and I wish somebody would have shared this with me when I was your age and I was sitting here and it is all about networking. So everything in the world, every, every deal, every time you need money, you're going to sign a contract, it's all related to a relationship and it's all related to people. Nothing happens. People have got all the answers. They've got everything. So this is one of my favorite authors. He wrote the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And there's something really interesting. So what I'm going to talk to you about is we're going to talk about how you're going to look for and build your own network. And it will become the most valuable asset that you have. But you notice he said everybody else looks for work. Well, guess where 75% of people find jobs? Anybody? Their network. So it doesn't matter personally or professionally. It's really critical for you to learn this skill. <clears throat> so I want you to write this down and never forget it. it. Took me a long time to figure this out. Your network equals your net worth. And there's some reasons for this. You know, it doesn't matter if you're building a business. It doesn't matter if you're creating wealth. It's absolutely critical for you to have. And why do you think it might be critical for you to have? Anybody? OK, so network intelligence. The secret is it's other people. It's other people who are going to help you, help you understand your assets and your market realities. Now, when I was at school here, like a few decades ago, I had a professor, my head professor was Dr. Ross Robson, who ran Shingo Prize. And I loved him dearly. I was one of only two women in the master's in, in economics. And he called me in his office one day, and he said, uh, we need to talk. He said, the men that are in your group don't want to be in your group anymore. And I said, really? Why not? And he said, they say you are too aggressive. And I went over to his desk and I said, I am not aggressive. <laughs> Who said?
said, I'm aggressive. I was a social worker, for heaven's sakes. And of course, I cried all the way as I drove back to Franklin, Idaho. But he said to me later, he said, you know, you can come across like a bull in a china closet. Well, the reality was, I grew up in Franklin, Idaho. I'm a hick. I, like, I don't know anybody that's got money. I think I'm dumb. So I mean, I'm studying till 1 AM, and I volunteered to be the leader of every one of my teams because, by gosh, we are going to get A's. So Ross was one of the first people outside of my friends and family who helped me understand who I was. And this is one of the most critical things you're going to learn from other people because it's going to protect you from your own blind spots. So number two, now that you understand yourself and people are going to help you find out where you fit, is going to help you find the right allies and trusted connections. Now this one is really, really important. And by the way, if you're taking notes, I'm happy to send you the slides. Now, interestingly, on this one, last year I was asked by uh, Cartagena Columbia Central Bank to come down and work with them a little bit on developing their entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I was taken to lunch by Dan Gerskoff. Dan was the former vice president of Google, and he has one of the fastest growing startups in the world, and it's called Lendo. It's a peer-to-peer -peer loan platform. And so Dan is telling me over lunch all of this black box, all of these significant algorithms so he can pick who's getting loans. And I said, you never meet with these people? He said, no. I said, so tell me really, what is the most significant thing about it? And he said, it's who refers you. Who refers you? And a lot of that will have to do with your reputation, which will follow you forever. Number three. It's going to help you track risk that is attached to any given opportunity. And that can even be a job. I don't know how many times in the past I took a job and I would write down the pros and I'd write down the cons. And I got the job and guess what? They switched. Uh, I would have been a lot better at it if I was able to do number three. And, th and all opportunities are not created equal. This is the same with people who may invest in your company. We'll talk about this later, but there are angels out there who are devils. And you've heard about venture capitalists that are vulture capitalists. So there always are risks. And when you go out and you find funding, you're always trying to <coughs> mitigate the risk. So you want, number one, the people who are going to help you with blind spots. You want to make sure that the people who are representing themselves as being great advisors, great investors, really are, and that you really understand the risk. All opportunities are not created equal. So when I was at the INEL, I was working hard. I had my degree. I was just really working. And I thought, why am I not getting ahead further? And I read this quote, and it said, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. And I thought, well, what do I need to be doing different? And what I found out a big part of that was indeed networking. Now, always change a losing game. Now, Jeremy Andrus, who became the CEO of Skull Candy and took it to that 550 million IPO, is writing the foreword to my book on super connecting. And he said to me, You know, Judy, I went to Harvard, got the MBA, I thought if I worked hard. And he said, Now, the older I've gotten, and he just turned 40, expecting his fourth little girl, it turns out it's who you know. And, and I would tell you, it's who knows you. So the second part is, that I'm going to talk about, and the first one was really how critical it is for you to have a, a network, a strategic, powerful network. What's holding you back? And when I talk to people, it boils down to about three things. And the first one is fear, fear of rejection, not asking. Fear is going to be something you will live with as long as you're alive. And if you don't deal with it now in a situation, all it does is make your fear grow bigger, bigger. And they've done research on this. They call it the lizard brain. And so you really have to work at getting out of your head and confronting your fears. Number two is challenge your assumptions. So what if they're wrong? I mean, think about all the different things that you believe. If they're wrong, then that's going to really significantly hold you back. The third thing is change your beliefs. 
So many of the beliefs that people have really prohibit them from networking, and we're going to go into those. And then this, you want to create political capital. You want to have people that are powerful who can help you get to where you want to go in life, either personally or professionally. As long as you're alive, you're going to need somebody that's going to help you. So this one is really, really important. I can't tell you how many billionaires I've accidentally met because I talked to somebody sitting on a plane that I didn't know. And I grew up thinking I was shy. So chance is really important. <coughs> so let's talk about rethinking your assumptions. And I'm going to show you mine. You know, the first one was I grew up in Franklin. I was shy. Uh, I was scared of everybody. Strangers, of course, I didn't talk to strangers. They're dangerous. That's what we're all taught. They're all dangerous. And geez, you know, first I wasn't a guy. Uh, didn't go to Harvard. I mean, any number of things, I didn't have the silver spoon. And here's what I found out. You know, if you think about the world, assumption, assume, is it makes an ASS out of you and me. <laughs> so you really need to think about your assumptions. And for those of you who don't know where Franklin is, I went to the same high school as Napoleon Dynamite. So you could say we're distant cousins. <laughs> So the real secret about networking is networking really isn't going around passing out cards. It is acquiring critical resources that you need to be successful. The first one's opportunities. Now, there are so many opportunities in the world, you couldn't even count them. But you're not going to find them unless you get in the game. You won't find them. Number two, connections. There's 7 billion people on the planet. And most of them, 95% of them, are not psychopaths. And all you have to do is ask. 7 billion people. Information. There's so much information now, they estimate it's doubling every year. And we now have it in the cloud. Money. How many of you have had economics know what the M1 is? How much money is in checking cash? Anyone? Uh, $48 trillion. The global GDP in the world is $84 trillion. There is no lack of money. Last year I had a gentleman call me and he had a billion dollars looking to invest. So there is no lack of money. There's all the information, all the connections, all the opportunities. But you have to get in the game because every one of these is attached to a human being. Every single one. So now, how to build a powerful network. Now, just imagine you're the person in the middle. That's you. And all, it turns out all groups are like this. Around you is this inner circle of usually five people, close friends, close family. And then it goes further out. Well, out at 150 is where it breaks down. At 150, the Roman, Empire, the Roman armies even broke apart. So even army groups don't go any higher than 150. And the th so the thing is, it doesn't matter if you've got a million people on Facebook, how many of those people are going to come help you or provide opportunities. So you should focus on quality, not on quantity. And what is really critical is you need to focus out here away from your friends and family. They already know each other and everything that's going on. And so the gold is right here on this edge. And they call this weak ties. That's where all the opportunities are. That's usually where you find the funding resources. And the truth is that you find that people are only, you have influence out three levels, a friend of a friend of a friend. So that's really where the strength of that is. So strategic networking, this is what I'm going to ask you to focus on, not just acquiring a bunch of people that will never help you. You need to know what it is you need. What is your goal? It could be as a company, you're going to be required to grow revenues, find a joint venture, strategic alliance, or track the next best thing, or find a job. What specifically is your goal when you're going to network? Then, who do you need? I often say, who is your who? 
who is it that you really need? Think about why and how you're going to get to them. And you can almost play like you're a detective. And, and there's a word in, in French, I think it's bricolage, but it's be resourceful and scrappy. Now, when I was here in graduate school, Dr. Robson often talked about how there never is a perfect time, that you never have all the resources that you need. So you have to figure out, given A and you don't have B, how can you still get to C? And you can. You always can. You know, people will come to me and they'll say, well, I just need a million two to get this company off the ground. Do you have any customers? No. Well, there's two reasons a startup company fails. Number one is lack of a customer. Number two is lack of money. So you have to really practice being scrappy and resourceful. Now, humans always group together. And as I've talked, here's the critical resources. So as you join groups and associations or you volunteer, these are all going to go up. So when I moved to Salt Lake eight years ago, I was asked by a friend to sit on Peter Caroon's committee to run for governor. From that association led to me meeting five billionaires, all who were interested in doing deals. Now, early on when I was young in Boise, Idaho, I didn't have, ever have an accounting class, and I knew I was going to have to learn how to do budgeting. I volunteered at United Way and said I want to be on the budget committee. So that was a way to fill a major gap for me that was very strategic. Attend curated events. So you can find that there's events that are happening in the angel groups with incubators. So if your goal is to get funded, you figure out, where's the money? Well, it turns out the people who are wealthy, they don't want their money in a bank because early stage startups have a, a return in ROI of 27%. So they're looking for a good deal. They've got a problem. You've got a solution. And this is the same with every human on the planet. So two weeks ago, I had dinner with Mark Burnett. Mark Burnett has a new movie coming out called Son of God. And he and his wife, Roma Downey, put $10 million into this movie, and he needed some help with marketing. Well, I happen to know the PR firm in New York who handles Deseret News. There will be a story Sunday coming out on that. So it doesn't matter how much wealth they have, how much whatever, Everybody's got a problem, and there is a possibility that you could have an answer. Meetup is a really interesting one if you've not looked at that. You can find interests in 45,000 cities. So there's always groups, and you want to do this because many groups are a total waste of your time. 90% of I can remember going to some networking event, and I felt like I was in a room of piranha. <laughs> You know, everybody in the room's broke or, or whatever. You're in, you're in the wrong room. <clears throat> so two questions. Are the people that are attending there smarter than you? Are they potential clients? Is there something really there of value? Otherwise, you really are wasting your time. So this is Charlie Munger, who is uh, Warren Buffett's bud. And, and I love this. Charlie was interviewed on TV, and he said, you know, every time I go to a conference and there's about 100 people, there's 20 people I don't care to ever meet again as long as I live. <laughs> I, I put up there no interest. There's five people I think I can't live without. There's 75 people wait and see. Now, the wait and see one is really interesting. Oprah often says, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Now, when I was your age, I used to think, you know, maybe I didn't communicate right. You know, maybe they need a little bit more training before I consider firing them. But I was just seeing the tip of the iceberg. So learn to look for yellow flags. Here's a good example for those of you that are going to uh, help grow businesses. This is an organization. It's called ACG. I've uh, given speeches at the one in, in New York and certainly the one in Salt Lake. They're global. 56 chapters, North America and Europe, 14,000 members. They have you show up, and everybody new gets to stand up, say who they are. They have a very nice lunch and a very nice speaker, and they will let you come for free for a few times. Now, there's a very powerful group. Another one is the Young Presidents Organization, YPO. Uh, many of these are out there. It just takes a little being scrappy to find them. 
So a lot of people your age will say to me, I don't really need to go do FaceTime. I can, I can get lots of people, 25 friends a day, max on Facebook, I can tweet. Uh, how many of those people are really gonna help you? Now the one I would ask you is, I hope everybody in this room is on LinkedIn. This is the most powerful network. There's now close to 300 million professionals on there. I know friends who have sourced money for their deals, people who have sourced jobs. So that one is absolutely a critical one. They all play a role. My adopted uh, son told me a couple of years ago I needed to tweet, and I'm like, are you kidding? 144 characters, what do I tweet? I'm sitting on the toilet? That's what I told him. <laughs> and he said, just do it. And so I started putting quotes I've collected since I was 13 years old, and I found that I loved it, and it helped me crystallize what was really important to me, and it was sharing wisdom, knowledge, and about deals. So I tweet a lot. Now, I want to talk to you for just a few minutes on your skill set. And this one is really important. So, if you just do these things right here, you will have the deepest, widest, robust network you can imagine. So, high-end networking, like I do, really requires high communication skill. And I tell people, learn to listen with your eyes, your ears, and your heart. The second one is learn how to tell your own story and be real. You know, people used to tell me I couldn't talk about religion. Well, one of the first things I tell people is when my dad retired from the military, moved me to Franklin, Idaho, he marched me to the Mormon church. I had not been raised religious. He was a Southern Baptist. My mother was a Mormon. Neither of them were religious. Um, and then recently, doing deals in Germany, I find out my last name's probably Klein, so I'm probably part Jewish, too. So you can be you, you can be real, and people can't help you unless they know what it is you need. So learn how to tell a story about you and say, you know, I'm looking to do this. And we're all looking to do something as long as we're alive. The third skill that you really need is the ask. And I tell people you've got to date first before you go to bed. You have got to build relationships. You do not walk up to an angel investor and say, don't you want to give me a million dollars? I've got this cool startup. They're going to go, yeah, right. What kind of dope are you smoking? <laughs> and so one that's absolutely critical is values. And you will find, while many of you have been raised in, in this community or in the state, that other people don't have those same values. And there's even really bad actors in this state. The number one thing that you look for is, is empathy on people's character. Now, when I invest in deals, I'm looking at people's judgment. Are they coachable? Do they listen? Can they learn? I also used to say that I only let people in my network who had a good head, a good heart, and a good gut. You can find people out there smarter than you all day long that would just as soon stab you in the back and own the majority of your company. Uh, you can find people out there that are great BSers. They don't keep their word. They don't keep their promises. They don't follow through, return phone calls. And I finally boiled it down to when I meet someone, and this is my own value, are you an Oprah or are you a Martha Stewart? <laughs> now, if I had to pick one that had my back and my future, it would be Oprah. And, and I would tell you, whether you're getting advisors, you're hiring people, look for some degree of, would this person have my back and have my future? Are they an Oprah or a Martha? And I'm going to be on Dr. Phil soon, and I hope I don't get asked that. <laughs> Someday I'll probably meet her. So speaking of bad actors, you know, after I got a couple of really significant bricks to the head, I decided that maybe I should try to figure out who these bad actors were, and some of the yellow flags that I would know ahead of time. They're charming with an answer for everything. They lack empathy. Rationalize their moral choice for their own self-interest. Lie repeatedly. Remember, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Conning, cunning and manipulative, always someone else's fault. Lack of remorse when they hurt others. This is actually a book, almost a psychopath. 
And it turns out these are highly concentrated and at the levels of business and venture capital and angel investors. And it turns out these people are driven like a moth is to a flame to money and power. And so that's why I say do due diligence on people and make sure it's an angel, not a devil. Uh, and, and be cautious. Now this is only 5% of the population, but it's an important one to avoid. Now the ask. This is hard and it's often much harder for women than men. If there's something you can gain, by all means ask. You know, the worst that happens is no. And so what? That's where you were before. And so this one is absolutely critical and I tell you to practice, practice, practice. You're going to be asking for a job interview. You're going to ask for funding. Uh, that's a pretty tough ask. So something that will help, and, and I have what I call the three golden questions. And the first one, when you're building your network, is how can I help you? If you have the focus that I'm helping you first, people will come and help you. At the bottom of all of my emails, I usually write, happy to help, best Judy. And people will call me, like uh, Daniel Corin, who, who owns Daniel K. Jewelers in New York, called me one day and said, I need you to help get me into China. And I called my friend Olin Weathington, who has worked for four presidents and was AIG's CEO, and we met in New York. And one of my friends said, why did he call you? And I said, because I can help and I will help. I am happy to help. And that establishes your reputation. So after you tell people your story, whether it's your pitch, whatever, and you never ask for money first, by the way, with a pitch, you ask, what other ideas do you have for me? And write them down. Because again, you're playing in the game of you need information, you need connections, you need opportunities, you may need funding. What other ideas? And you listen really closely. Who else do you know I should talk to? Now this is how I went from a personal trainer in Salt Lake to Tim Draper, Draper VC. So you know, I said influence is a friend of a friend of a friend. Well, when you get out to that third person and you ask, who else should I talk to? They'll say, oh, you know, I hadn't thought of this before, but you need to talk to my friend Eileen. And then you do the same thing. You will develop the most powerful network. Now, I've never left Utah and Idaho. And I'm not one person away from Obama. I'm one times 10. The same with Oprah, Bill Gates. And, and I did it by doing this, even though I thought I was shy. And by the way, you can be shy. It isn't an issue if you need to be an extrovert. It's an issue if you need to engage which is back to that skill set of listening. So something that also helps is to map it. And you put you down, what it is you need, which ecosystem do you need to be in? There's lots of them out there. And we'll get into what room you need to be in, the resources you're needing. And then what would the metric be if it was a successful outcome for you? Now I'm going to give you an example of the funding ecosystem. So oftentimes when I meet people and they're looking at deals or the VCs that I work with, people are pitching, they're in the wrong room. Now, in the United States, a few years ago, this was how the venture capital, how the finance ecosystem, funding ecosystem looked. And interestingly, the majority of money already comes from friends and family. Now that will go up, they estimate, to 300 billion because of crowdfunding, which is the game changer that is going to uh, really make a difference in the world. Now this is a room. Now this is a very different room in this ecosystem than angel investors. Angel investors are accredited. Uh, they're looking for high potential deals. They want their money back in three to five years and usually five to 10 X. These guys venture, they want 10 to 20 times their money back. And so the minute you take money from one of these characters, you can plan on not having an exit from your company for 10 years. And a totally different one is corporate venture capitalists. Now initially, there were over a thousand venture capital groups in the United States. That is now down to 400. And of those, only half have invested, deployed 5 million of capital annually for five years. But here, there's now 807 of these. 
So Intel, all of these companies now have venture capital arms, and it's because they're looking for early stage deals. Vitamin water. They went to Coke, and Coke said, you're too early, we're not interested, you don't have enough traction, how do we know you'll really work? Three years later, they bought them for $100 million. And the board of directors said, boys, 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 you need to buy these companies earlier. Now there's two that are in rooms that most people don't know of, and one of them is family offices. These are people that usually have a net worth of 200 million and above, and they have a team that manages their portfolio. I now have people from family offices calling me looking for early stage deals. And now even foundations are looking for deals. So here's an ecosystem. All of these are different rooms, and you need to have knowledge of what room you need to be in. Now the VCs and the angels will tell you 90% of the deals they see that you're pitching in the wrong place. So the ecosystem is important, and then what room? Now I did just a piece of mine to show you a mind map. Now Mark Cuban, what a character. Anyway, I, so I moved to Salt Lake. I asked Dee to go check at KSL for a piece of exercise equipment. I met Susan who introduced me to Mark Eaton of jazz fame, who introduced me to his friend, his friend, his friend. When I met this woman, I ended up in Golden Seeds, third largest angel group in the world. And from there, uh, I've met a Nobel Prize winner, Myron Scholes, the Black Scholes formula. Um, Itzhak Fisher, who's taken five companies IPO. Guy Kawasaki, Draper VC. Rosie Rios at the Treasury is a friend of mine. Meg Whitman uh, had lunch with Gina Davis have only lived in Utah and Idaho, thought I was shy. And at first, here was, who else do you know I should talk to? Who else do you know I should talk to? But as soon as I hit one, look what happened. So there's that focus on the critical 50. I mean, if you just have five of this person's people, <laughs> look what you can do. Now, I did that as a mind map, but I first did it with Post-its just on a wall just to see what would happen. And something that you can do, uh, this is my friend Mike Muni. He founded ACT Software. And he has a program out called VIP Orbit. It's free for your iPhone. And it's rated number one in the world for contacts, being able to track your contacts. So here we are, trying to build our network. And you know, I hear this all the time, you know, isn't this just miserable, awful, I don't know how I'm going to do it. And, and I tell you, it can be done, it doesn't matter, if you didn't go to Harvard, you were shy, whatever. And I want you to really focus on building a powerful network, focus on the 50 critical people, and get in the game. Because unless you're in that flow with people, you're going to miss out on opportunities, funding, connections money, all of those things. Um, my assistant put this in here, but I have a book coming out by McGraw-Hill. And so if you would like to uh, get some freebies, I've put together a, a bunch of stuff, and you're welcome to contact me on LinkedIn if I can help any of you. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Any, any questions? At the time that you were going up the ladder to KSL and so on and so forth, did you have an objective at the time that you were seeking that role? You know, I didn't initially. I, I did not initially, but I told people who I was and what I was interested in. And then they said, oh, you should meet Mark Eaton. So I met Mark Eaton. <laughs> <laughs> Went to his house. He has this huge uh, chair. Uh, and so I always, it's that very first question of how may I help you? So I focus on meeting other people, building the relationship, seeing if I can help, and being very helpful, trying to add value, figure out what it is that they need. And it can just be sending a report, making an introduction, and after you've done it a few things, then it clicks, and then other people send people back to you, and pretty soon you have critical mass. Anything else? <laughs> Yes? Oh, it's 96. Sorry. Yeah, 96,000. So much for that assistant. <laughs> so I'm friends with Clay Mask, who owns Infusionsoft, which is going to go public this year. 
And uh, Cloyd said to me, well, if you're going to do a book and you're gonna, I'm going to be on Dr. Phil, all this stuff, he said, you should have a way to share. I've made spreadsheets for people. Uh, I'm going to do a template on VAIP Orbit to give to people. And I have quotes that I've collected since I was 16, some of them that have been really helpful to me. I think there was one other one somewhere. It's a very promising field. So biotech, I worked for a company called MDI, and we had an AIDS compound and an aromatase inhibitor for breast cancer that I acquired in Germany. Some of the biggest IPOs, biggest companies that are sold now start in the, the life science area. So it is very promising. There's two or three guys in Salt Lake, one in Park City, who routinely start these companies and literally flip them. They sell them at year three for eight to 12 million, and then they repeat. The one fellow is so good at this that, of course, that he has 200 people that are willing to put in money at any time. Now, that's medical devices, but yes, a lot of opportunity. Dee, who's sitting here in front, left Skull Candy, went to Montagen, which sold to Supergen for 45 million at year three, and it was oncology. And I said to Dr. David Beers, how did you do that? It usually takes 800 million to get a drug to market. And he said, I anticipated who the most likely person that, to acquire the company would be. And I got one person out of each of those companies on an advisory board. And then they had a bidding war. Didn't even have a drug. Because Myriad Genetics has gone there. Myriad. Yes. Yeah, and there, there are powerful groups. Like most people in high tech end up going to Silicon Valley just because it is so fertile, really. Anything else? When are you going to be on Dr. Phil? I think in June. But I'll tell them so they can put something out. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Um, you said you'd like to share some of your quotes on Twitter. What is your Twitter handle? At Judy Robinette. Tweet, LinkedIn, share information. I love, I love that. And if there's anything I can help with, I will. Looking for a job or a career right after graduation, do you have any specific guidelines or tips? What everybody has are looking. Dentist, postman, I mean, it is amazing where you'll find. So often people will write to me and they'll say, Judy, I need this, and maybe I can't find it. I'll send an email out to 10 people. Every time I'll get an answer, it's never from the person I guessed. So there's an old saying, I guess, that you have to shake the tree hard to get apples, but it's never the tree you shake that they first fall from. <laughs> and, and I kind of think about in Yellowstone, it takes five times for a wolf to make a kill. So you, you repeat, repeat. You let everybody know, I would certainly make sure that you get on LinkedIn, people are finding jobs on Twitter. So it is letting people know your story and what you're about and what you're interested in. Um, you know, I, I don't have tons and tons, but I try on the weekends just to catch up. Like if I find something that is really valuable, I get reports from Deutsche Bank uh, that I will send out to 15, 20 people because I know that they will like that. But I really do focus on that 20, 25 to 50 people. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Oh, I'm sorry. One more. One final. Well, it certainly is. So if you end up being in biology or a science, and, and I see this all the time, doctors, brilliant, they'll come up with an idea, they do not know how to commercialize it. So certainly an MBA will teach you the business side of how to monetize. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you.